doing is what causes environmental problems. So I started advising people who came to me for career advice saying, you want to save the planet, don't become an environmental lawyer, don't become an environmental scientist, become an environmental business person. Welcome everyone. This is going to be a very exciting session and we look forward to our discussion uh, with Rob this afternoon. To set the stage, Rob will be speaking to us about market transformation. And this concept is one that is very provocative and very central uh, to thinking today in the world of business and also very much here at uh, Columbia Business School and Columbia University more broadly. Uh, Rob's thinking is, is pivotal to two key pillars we have here in our priorities at the business school. One of them being climate change. Uh, and so we'll hear a lot about climate change, the urgency around it and how market transformation can be a solution uh, to that uh, crisis and that that central pillar. And second, business and society. So Rob, as we'll hear, is, is very thoughtful about the interplay between standards and regulation. And as you heard from the introduction that Matt gave, uh, Rob, amongst his many achievements, was a pioneer in the lead business uh, building standards. Uh, and that was, a, you know, one of the most prominent standard setting uh, in, uh, initiatives. And we'll hear more from him about uh, his work in standards, as well as his thoughts on regulation. So very excited and, again, grateful to have you here, Rob, with us this afternoon uh, and look forward to your remarks on market transformation. And we've decided we'll, we'll set up the conversation in, in three different parts. So we're going to start by hearing from Rob about what market transformation is and why it matters. And then from there, we will talk a bit about some mind shifts that he's calling us to make in terms of how we think about markets, regulation, and standards. And then finally, he'll talk to us about the road forward and we'll take your questions and comments. So Rob, without further ado, can you tell us more about this idea of market transformation and why it matters so much? Sure, Amar, and thanks so much. I really appreciate this invitation from the business school, and thanks for everybody tuning in to the uh, Bright Conference. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, and so, you know, I guess markets are kind of like uh, quality. Uh, you know, it's hard to define what it is. We kind of know them when we see them, but if you ask, you know, 100 people what a market is, you'll probably get 100 different answers. Um, and so the, the, the concept that I'd like to uh, transmit is um, uh, that, you know, market, tra transforming markets uh, is, you know, it's not, it's not, um, uh, it's not chance, uh, but you can actually do something about it. Now, I don't know if you can see my screen, I'm trying to share. Okay, so uh, any market can be transformed, uh, and and it's not fate. Uh, you know there are there are clear steps uh, that does require coordination between the private sector and the public sector. So I think one of the most important things to understand uh, is aside from the fact that you know transforming markets is is uh, you know conscious and and not accidental, uh, but that both the private sector and the public sector are necessary, but neither are sufficient. In other words, you know, some people who say all we have to do is price things right. A, prices will never be right, uh, and B, uh, adjusting prices will only get you so far. Uh, the other sort of edge of the camp are people who say, oh, we just need to regulate, right? And, and, and regulation will take care of everything. Uh, they are both correct and wrong at the same time. You know, market regulations are absolutely necessary, uh, as well as uh, the proper um, you know, voluntary and, and market-based systems. And, 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 and the, the challenge is, is how do we uh, coordinate those uh, and get them together? Um, so I, I'm going to spend 30 seconds talking about stuff we already know. Uh, you know, we are here. Uh, we need to be there. Uh, as, as recently as the prior uh, administration in the U.S. government, uh, a four degrees C, seven degrees Fahrenheit was basically considered the baseline. In other words, when, when they were doing program evaluation, they assumed a, a four degree world. Um, and, you know, we are not even at a one degree world uh, and getting into the profound uh, uh, nonlinearity of, of complex systems that have been perturbed outside of their uh, equilibrium uh, is something that we as a species has, have never uh, 
uh, addressed before. And the, 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 the profound impacts of nonlinear changes in weather, uh, rain patterns, sea level rise, things are gonna happen way faster than we are uh, even remotely considering them happening right now. And, and concomitantly, there will be uh, very profound nonlinear changes in what we call society unless we start really uh, moving. And this is kind of where the market transformation goes into, uh, you know, trying to move towards a three to three degree C world as quickly as possible and ideally a two. Uh, 1.5 is, is just, it's, it ain't gonna happen, but we can probably keep things between two and three. And that way we can keep the fabric of society from unraveling. Uh, but the reality is, is that the you know, SS business as usual hit the iceberg back in the seventies. You know, we had a chance back then when sort of our addiction to fossil fuels uh, and, and we had a, a, the, the, the major perturbation, you know, when I was in high school of the, uh, of the uh, oil embargo and then the subsequent price rise, that was sort of our signal that we hit something. And, and, and the thing that's fascinating to me is, is how apt uh, the Titanic disaster is for the situation that we're in, right? So SS business as usual is going down. There's literally nothing we can do about it. Uh, and, and, you know, it's really fascinating to see people's reaction. Like uh, one of the survivors quoted, many of the passengers did not believe that the ship was sinking. How many people uh, do not believe that climate change is real? Uh, and they're not willing to sort of jump into uh, the uncertain lifeboat of sustainability or uh, something that changes. So as a result, many of the lifeboats left half full. And, and obviously, you know, you're on a big ship that's supposedly unsinkable. Uh, even the engineers, uh, are saying, oh, you know, we didn't think there was that much damage. You know, everybody knew it was unsinkable. And so, you know, we made coffee to think about it, right? And then, of course, it's that last five minutes when the awful realization that the end was at hand. And we're kind of, we're kind of like at minute, you know, I'll say eight right now, uh, that, you know, we've got a little bit of time to kind of get in the lifeboats, uh, but, you know, time is definitely running out. Uh, you know, having, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, um, I, I founded the Lead Green Building Rating System back in 1993. I'm doing something similar for solid waste called SWEEP, which is Solid Waste Environmental Excellence Performance Standard. Uh, and people say, well, you know, how do you solve big problems? And, and so, the, you know, I sort of uh, riff off something called the genius prayer is, is, is to, you know, grant me the courage to change things that I cannot accept, right? So if there's a problem, get off your rear end and fix it. Because that's the only way it's going to happen. Nobody, you know, there's no, you know, ghost in the machine that's going to come and save us. Technology is not going to save us. It's going to be you getting in there and fixing things. I was an environmental uh, scientist. I got a master's in energy and resources from Berkeley back in, in 1990. Uh, I realized that the public, uh, the, that the private sector was responsible for 80% of doing, and uh, doing is what causes environmental problems. So I started advising people who came to me for career advice saying, you want to save the planet, don't become an environmental lawyer, don't become an environmental scientist, become an environmental business person, because relative to the need, there are very few environmental business people. So if my uh, conceit was creating a, you know, a new paradigm for changing business, then I needed to know something about it, which is why I went to business school. Plus the fact that lead was growing 50% a year, year on year, and we were getting into problems that I couldn't solve by myself. And that's why I got the tools at Columbia Business School and literally saved the system with some of the stuff that we put in place right before we hit the tornado. Uh, we jumped the chasm between the innovators and the early mass market. And you know, if, if we hadn't put in some of the things, some of the tools that I learned in, at Columbia, uh, it would have been failed. So solving big problems, First, you bite the problem in the ass. That means learning about it and really, really digging in. And then the second thing you do is not let go for 10 years because big problems do not get solved overnight. And so you, 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 know, you really need to dig in and uh, be in for the long haul. Anybody can do it. Uh, obviously, inspiration is a large part of it, but perspiration 
uh, is as much as anything. Uh, the insight about market transformation came from the work that I did in California on utilities and appliance standards. Uh, and you know those programs have saved well over a quarter of statewide energy use and uh, only cost about a quarter of the average utility bill. Back in the early stages, the first thing they did was set standards. That's the most important thing. And then they enforced them, which is the second most important thing. Uh, so what happened was we set up appliance standards. We set building standards, very simple at first. And then the utilities created market mechanisms mechanisms uh, to incentivize uh, installing uh, appliances, and installing building standards. And what that allowed to do was as the market developed for each of these things and efficiency got uh, farther along, it allowed the standard setting process to move to the next level. So there was nice interplay between the market mechanisms and the appliance standards. And what ended up happening was uh, we got three times the energy that we would have had from either one of those by themselves by combining the two. So that's what I mean by market transformation. There are other examples of this, but this is a very clear example where uh, the financial incentives uh, complemented and supplemented uh, the performance. So what that looks like in a so uh, first you you know if you want to transform a market, you create a plan. Uh, you have a regulatory path and a market path. You, you obviously need legislation. So if you're being strategic, part of your plan is figuring out what are the strategic enabling legislation that I need. Then you do code, then you do demonstration projects. The purpose of demonstration projects is showing what is potential technically. Uh, then what you do is based on that technical information, you develop voluntary standards and then you scale it up. The pilot scale is different from demonstration in that you're doing administrative uh, mechanisms because you need both technical robustness and a clear uh, mechanism for delivering things to the market. And that's when you jump into implementation. Once you've got the technical thing down and you got the uh, delivery plan down, uh, then you jump to full implementation, but you can't stop there. You have to continuously improve. So every time you got a new improvement, then you can bump up the codes. Uh, you bring in things from the market and uh, make those mainstream. And then you also need an innovation loop uh, in the market-driven green area to, to keep those things going. So all these things complement. And then there's supp supplementary things you do. You can't manage what you don't measure, but you can't measure what you haven't defined. So having your indicators and your measurements and your definitions for what are you measuring, what's success is very important. You need uh, to have training programs. You can exercise market power as uh, somebody who is um, an actor in this by procuring things, uh, in financial incentives, uh, administrative incentives are very important. And then you need an uh, you know, industry capability developed and as well, uh, you can develop market demand through public education. Uh, so they're complementary. You know, basically you want minimum standards to go uh, uh, up. Uh, remember what we're taught, when we're talking about min min minimum standards, uh, the other definition for that is if we did it any worse, it would be illegal, right? So this is bare minimum. This is not, you know, there's no energy savings here. This is basically, this is the minimum acceptable. Uh, typically in the building, uh, it'll, be, it'll depend on what you're trying to transform. In the building sector is three to five years. Uh, and in order to get above that, you want to create incentives to go beyond. So that's where standards like LEED come in, is you create voluntary market leadership standards, you create incentives to go beyond the market, you build capacity for the next round. Uh, the next round of standard comes in, uh, in order to get them going when you need them, you do early adopter incentives, uh, and then you basically you know, rinse and repeat uh, on the stairwell uh, going forward. Now, a lot of people think that efficiency is, is you know, uh, in this part here, right? That's, that's where we get the bump of efficiency in, and that's what the purpose of standards is. That is not the purpose of standards. Where you get the, where you get the improvement is in voluntary market leadership standards. But what the standards do do is they get rid of the illegal stuff, right? So that's what standards do. The voluntary things raise the bar, the standards get rid of the worst performers, and that's how they complement each other and ladder up. You don't want the standards to go too far, otherwise you get market rebellion. And that's why it's important to be on a schedule and to be disciplined about it. Well, no, thank you so much, Rob. There's uh, so much richness in what you said. And I, you know, we hear you talking about the urgency of the problem. We hear you talking about the interplay between these two elements that are both necessary, but neither is sufficient. 
being the standards and the regulation. Uh, and thank you for also showing us just now the interplay between the two. Uh, everyone, please uh, do send your questions in on the Q&A feature. Uh, we hope to leave some time for your questions and I'm sure they'll be very uh, provocative and deep ones. So we look forward to, to the Q&A part uh, as we move now to the second element of our discussion, which is the mind shift. So Rob, you, you are suggesting some ways in which we need to think differently. If I may ask you to share that and also your, your Columbia experience you've already alluded to as being formative. And I know that your thinking was also formative on our uh, student body here and on our faculty as well. So as you talk about the mind shift, uh, if you may also share a bit about how uh, you uh, helped move the needle here at Columbia in terms of how we think about these things. Well, I, again, I, you know, it's, it's hard to know how much, uh, you know, movement there was after I left. I, I do know that, you know, when I was arguing about the inadequacy of most of the tools, which I'll sort of talk about that, you know, most of the tools that we learn in business school are just wholly inadequate for actually solving the problem. Um, you know, people would be, you know, sort of in the back going, shut up, you know, uh, when I would, when, when I would, you know, try and engage the professors in this conversation. Uh, but by the end of my tenure, you know, I had people coming up to me with articles about, you know, environmental problems, environmental business, et cetera, you know, that, and, and that, that there was a lot more engagement. So I, I do think that, um, you know, there, there, at least, you know, there was, there, there was some needle movement and the fact that climbing, I mean, you know, I was the only person talking about climate change back in, in, in 04 to 06. And now that climate change is one of the key things of the business. Uh, did I have something to do with that? Maybe, I, you know, uh, I'd need to see the data, but, you know, if, if I did make a small contributor contribution to that, then, then good for me. Um, you know, because, but, you know, understanding the problem really, we have to understand where we are in the ecosystem. And, 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 I, and I actually find that a business analogy is really, really apt. Okay. So we are Humanity Inc. And we are a wholly owned subsidiary of Planet Co. Now, if you think about what the business of Planet Co. is, it is basically uh, creating um, uh, life and sustaining it. Okay, now you start looking at what Humanity Inc. is doing to the Planet Co. bottom line in terms of uh, creating and sustaining life. And, and we're doing okay as uh, ourselves as a species, right? Uh, but every other species is not doing so hot. And, and, and the idea that we can, you know, create hostile conditions for other species and not somehow suffer our own. Every time a species, you know, goes extinct or we create, you know, some sort of disaster, it's like another saw cut in the branch that we're sitting on. Uh, so, you know, we really need to understand uh, that, you know, the laws of the planet are not the laws that we are following, right? Chemistry, biology, and physics are the organizing principle and organizing laws of the planet. And yet we, we rely on things like economics, right? And, and or, or as I call them, egonomics. And, and, and the sad fact is, is that none of the isms, capitalism, communism, socialism, none of the isms work anymore. We need a completely new paradigm uh, for moving that forward. Um, so, you know, what does that look like? You know, what, what is a paradigm? Um, well, it's not a pair of dimes, obviously, but I think one of the, uh, you know, one of the best quotes to represent what a paradigm is, uh, well, it came from Albert Einstein, that we cannot solve the problems with the same thinking we use to create them, uh, which leads us to, you know, right now we've got an 18th century concept called, that I call egonomics, because it's all about humans and it's all about us. It's not about any other species. Egonomics is structurally incapable of solving our problems. Structurally, nothing, nothing, nothing we can do using the conventional framework of egonomics will help us solve climate. The reason is that the impact of the transaction is fundamentally separate from the transaction itself. And so we come up with all these kludges like taxes and adders and this and that, but the, but the, the, the ex very existence of externalities, i.e. the impact is separate, and which is central to egonomics, means that we can't solve our problems with this. So I'd like to propose something that uh, a friend of mine, Keith Dickey, uh, when we were talking about this said, well, why don't we call it ethonomics, right? Where we're, we're considering things outside of ourselves. What's the, what's the broader etho to that? So what does that, you know, again, what does that look like? Uh, good question, right? Um, you know, we've got sort of donut economics and a, and a few sort of ideas where we've got these qualitative 
uh, ideas about what it means. But you know, how do we integrate chemistry, biology, and physics fundamentally into our system of, of you know, building wealth uh, and, and you know, creating profit? Right? There's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong with profit. But if we have to exploit other species or other people to get there, then that's a problem. It's, it's a short-term problem, and ultimately, it's a long-term problem for our species. You know, I, one, one analogy I like is, is sort of the evolution of how we thought. You know, Ptolemy's uh, model of the solar system worked pretty well. In fact, he thought it was the universe. Earth's, Earth's at the center, sun revolves around it, as does the other planet, and humans and, and the Earth are, are at the center. And then we came across this fellow, Nicholas Copernicus, who actually said, gee, you know, uh, we cannot explain what we are seeing in the universe with the sun at the center, I th uh, with, the, with the Earth at the center. I think the sun's at the center, and we sort of call that today an inconvenient truth. Um, that, you know, no, this, this paradigm of us being at the center of everything and somehow chemistry, biology, and physics can re uh, revolve around us as opposed to the other way around, uh, that, that's sort of the crux of it. Now, we've, we saw, uh, you know, when people were wrestling with this paradigm shift, a lot of effort and energy going into trying to keep things the way they were. So this guy Tycho Brahe came up with this really weird uh, system of, of rotation where, you know, the Earth and the Moon are at the center, and then the Sun is revolving, and then the planets revolve around the Sun. And, and you know, this is the, the, if you look at the actual diagrams, you know, Saturn and, and Jupiter do these weird curly Q things uh, part way through. So, you know, people are bending backwards to try and keep our egonomic system in place, uh, not, not, you know, recognizing that no matter what we do, it's not going to work. Uh, so, you know, we've got a choice. We can, uh, you know, stick with econo politics, economics, and habit, uh, or we can realize that chemistry, biology, and physics are ultimately what are going to prevail. Because, again, in the celebrity smackdown between those uh, three parties, uh, we know which one's going to win. So our, you know, our job is to figure out uh, what's next. Wonderful, Rob. Well, why don't you stay on that? We have eight minutes left, and I, I want to make sure we are able to hear from our attendees. So why don't you take us into the roadmap there, uh, and then uh, we can have uh, we can take it further with our questions and, and yeah. the dialogue. So this is the least satisfying part of the, uh, you know, one of the things I learned in my, um, you know, managing uh, organizations, leadership and management of organizations is that to, to satisfactorily solve problems, you need a problem, a solution, and a pathway. And, you know, I, I think I understand, I've, I've defined a problem, I think I've got kind of a solution. Uh, how to get there, I have no idea. And one of the reasons I talk about this and I recognize that it's, it's unsatisfying is that I'm hoping that somebody smarter than I am who's out there is like, oh, you just do X. And, and, or maybe just get people thinking about it because we, we need to get off of the old isms. And we need to stop arguing about capitalism uh, versus communism or, or socialism. You know, because all of these isms send us off the cliff. Some may send us off the cliff at 50 miles an hour. Some may send us off the cliff at 20 miles an hour. But I'm not any more comfortable going off a cliff at 20 than I am at 50, right? So this does not do me any good. The point is to slow the car down enough, turn it around so we don't go off the cliff. And that's, and that's what we need to do, right? And, and, and obviously, you know, calling things like climate change a big hoax and, you know, I mean, there are a lot of things we can do to slow things down. And that's what LEAD does. That's what SWEEP does. A lot of things I'm doing right now uh, are creating systems to A, put people into lifeboats because there's, I can't do anything about that. I can't do anything about the shift, but I can save people. Um, and that's how I, I prevent getting depressed. Um, and there are a lot of things that we know what to do that can slow the car down. So hopefully, in parallel, like we did with time, like we did with latitude and longitude, we can begin convening some global uh, things. And, you know, again, we've got some good seats like the, again, I, I like the donut economics people. It's, it's, it's very qualitative right now, but, you know, there, there are a lot of the principles that we need to be articulating uh, are in that. Um, and so, you know, we just need to, um, you know, try and get out front. You know, there's always the dilemma that, you know, uh, when a leader is 100 paces ahead of his followers is revered and called a visionary, but when they're 1,000 paces ahead, they're stoned and called heretics. And I've seen that attributed to Gandhi. I don't know if he uh, said it. I haven't been able to find it online, but it is an issue um, that, you know, you need to deal with. You need to stay close enough to where you are to get your idea connected to the train. 
and then you can start pulling it. Because if you build a completely separate pack, a track, you might have your shiny engine and it goes by yourself, but you know all of the engine and all the things that you're trying to pull with you uh, don't come. Uh, and so, you know, eventually we're this inconvenient truth is now it's going through Schopenhauer's stages, right? It's it was ridiculed initially, and then we're sort of in the violent opposition, and very soon we will be uh, in the self-evident. So hopefully we can move, uh, you know, we can we can transition from egonomics to ethonomics uh, by beginning. Uh, you know, the conversation, I'm sure there will be plenty of ridicule. And then I'm sure that there are plenty of vested interests that will be violently opposed. But, you know, this is the thing that's going to get us uh, sort of after the collapse uh, is going to set humanity on the right track. So that's, uh, you know, and, and the good news is that, you know, ideas and technologies are spreading faster and faster than ever before. So even though we are really up against it, you know, in terms of, you know, climate and everything like that, never in history have we had the ability to engage, mobilize, and actualize people and technology. So that's what we need, scale, scope, and speed. We now have the ability to do it, and that's what we need to do is to start doing it. Wonderful. Thank you, Robin. We've, we've already got questions coming in here. We have a question from Diane, one from Sumita, and I, I'll put them forward to you and maybe add one of my own as well that, that relates to them. So Diane is asking about the paradigm shift. She says it's appealing, but uh, is it realistic uh, that we will adopt it? So can we make that switch from Ptolemy to Copernicus? Uh, is that, how feasible is it? Sumita is asking about lobbying uh, and how, um, in, in her words, uh, the animal agricultural lobbyists um, have a stranglehold uh, over policy. Uh, so if you can speak a bit about lobbying, speak a bit about the paradigm shift, and perhaps if it's relevant, uh, how you went from lead to sweep, and presumably I'm sure that you, you applied lessons from lead and perhaps added new ones as you went to, to, to that uh, shift. So um, if you could address those three areas, Rob. Your, yeah, so I mean, again, the big the, the, the problem humans have is that they think that because all of their laws involve other humans, they think that there's a negotiation involved, right? You don't negotiate with physics, you don't negotiate with chemistry, you don't. This is this is something that we've never. We if we go bankrupt, if we if we you know, there is always a way within the human system of negotiation. Okay, that does not exist with this. So we we, we need to understand. I mean, it's like. Nature is simple, fit in or get kicked out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not about the whales, guys. It's about us. It's, you know, we are saving ourselves. And, and the biggest problem with egonomics is that right now, it's not cost effective to save us. And so are we willing to just give up our species or should we give up this human creation that lasted? Okay. Did, you know, it did its thing. And now we need to do something else that actually can get us through this. Um, and, you know, again, the, we've had the technology. I mean, honestly, Carter had pretty much all the right idea back in the day. Yeah, there were, there were a couple of mistakes, but if we had actually implemented them at the scale, scope and speed that Carter was talking about, we honestly would not be having this conversation right now. We've known what to do for decades. And, you know, it's the politics and a set of tools that is structurally incapable of giving us the right answer that have basically, uh, you know, caused the, the mess that we're in. We need new tools uh, to, to, you know, complement and supplement the growing awareness that we have. Perfect. Well, Rob, in the last minute we have, there's a question about stakeholders and who will be most critical. And if you could, as, as we close out, tell people how they can reach you and stay in touch and, and continue engaging with you on this vitally important topic. Yeah, okay. Well, so um, my email is rk as in kangaroo, Watson, W-A-T-S-O-N, at Upland Road, uh, one word, U-P-L-A-N-D-R-O-A-D, dot E-C-O. That's the one that, that's the thing that messes people up is dot eco, dot E-C-O. So feel free to shoot me a note saying, I saw you on, on Bright. I think you're full of blank. Um, and you know, here's why you're wrong or you know, sign me up for uh, saving, saving humanity. Um, I'm, I'm happy to engage at, at all levels. Um, you know, if you wanna get involved with SWEEP, uh, we have lots of volunteers helping us. Um, and you know, again, uh, you know, like I said, uh, 
wanting to change the world uh, and, and recognizing you know, business and economics at the core of us was, was literally why I went to business school. I got great tools at, at the institution and you know, I, I hope that others want to you know, be that future that, that they want and, and use the tools that you've gained through your education and affiliation with Columbia to make the world a better place.